Hello and welcome to the DeathCast. I am your host, author, and journalist Ian Tott, and I'd like to thank you for joining me as we prepare to take our eighth look at the life and crimes of Ted Bundy. Before we get into it this week, as always, I have the normal show notes. If you'd like to follow me on social media, just search for the DeathCast, DeathCast True Crime, or DeathCast Official. If you'd like to help support the show, there's a couple of ways you can do this. First and foremost, you can go to tinyurl.com backslash dcast patreon, where for as little as $1.99 a month, you can get access to early ad-free shows, as well as exclusive content, just like my first two Patreon members, Channel and Anthony, did many months ago. All right. Now that all that's out of the way, find yourself a nice, comfy chair. Kick back and relax. I've got my coffee. I've got my cigarettes. Let's go into the crypt. When we left off last week, it was the early morning hours of January 15th, 1978. The savage attack at the Chai Omega house had left two dead and three seriously wounded, along with a further attack a few hours after this on Cheryl Thomas, who was savagely assaulted. Obviously, the police are stunned by this, as is Tallahassee as a whole, and the police are really pulling out all of the stops in an effort to try and discover who is responsible for these crimes. Now, they don't have a whole lot to go on. To the best of their knowledge, there are no fingerprints at any of the scenes that cannot be accounted for, nor is there any form of blood stains from the perpetrator. There really isn't any semen that cannot be accounted for, except for this mysterious stain on Cheryl's bedsheet, which is pretty much put down to being from a previous lover. The only thing that they have are the bite marks, which, as discussed, are going to be crucial in convicting Ted Bundy of these crimes, and which if presented in court today, would be discounted as bite marks are really part science, part art form, meaning they have no legal standing in most courtrooms. It's kind of like polygraph examinations. You know, anybody can read it any way that they choose to, It's really a pseudoscience that is highly fallible, and this is due to the fact that flesh has a tendency to roll and move as it is bitten, thus warping the bite marks and making it impossible to positively identify the set of teeth that the marks have come from. They also have the two hairs found at the Thomas scene inside of the mask. Again, this is questionable evidence. Not that hair evidence is irrefutable, but these hairs don't contain the roots of the hairs, meaning that it cannot 100% be conclusively tied to Ted Bundy. They can be tied to him to, with a matter of certainty. However, the amount of people these hairs could have come from is vastly expanded without the roots being present. Uh, I forget the exact statistic, but hypothetically, without the root, we could say that the hair could be, you know, one in 40,000, meaning the hair could have come from every one in every 40,000 people, meaning it's not definitive that Ted Bundy, in fact, left these hairs. And Bundy supporters would later claim that these hairs had, in fact, been planted after the fact, meaning when he was already in custody, as you're going to see. 
when we get to it, his trials, the judge actually ordered Bundy to give hair and DNA evidence, which at this point in time was really in its infancy, but also was unheard of for a judge. Not long before the murders at the Chi Omega house, an individual by the name of Randy Reagan, who lived close to the Chi Omega house, the oak where Bundy was staying, as well as the apartment that Cheryl Thomas was living in, noticed that the license plate on his Volkswagen camper was missing, and he immediately contacted the DMV, let them know that, hey, somebody stole my plates, and went on with his life. And now this is going to be important later on in our story, as these plates are going to come back and be used as evidence that are going to tie Ted Bundy to a van. The license plate number was 13-D-11300. Remember that number. On February 5th, a man by the name of Freddie McGee, who worked for the University of Florida's audiovisual department, contacted law enforcement to let them know that a large white van was missing from the AV department's parking lot and that the van had numbering on it as well as a University of Florida designation on the back of the vehicle. Police take the report. No one sees this vehicle driving around and while they know it's gone, there's little that they can do about it. Obviously, I think you can see where this is going. Ted Bundy has stolen this van, and he'd also stolen these the license plates and put them on the van. If law enforcement had been more diligent in their duties, and no, I'm not saying that what's coming is their fault, they would have noticed that the plates on the van did not match the type of vehicle that it was, as the way that the plates in Florida work, the numbers on the plates designate not only what county the vehicle's registered in, but also the type of vehicle, i.e. a small vehicle, a large vehicle, an extra large vehicle, that type of thing. Possibly because of his innate ability to blend into the background or because the police's attention was diverted due to the horrific attacks that had occurred. No one saw this van driving around with the numbering from the college that had been reported missing or noticed that the plates didn't match the vehicle. And naturally, this is going to have tragic consequences. For at this point, Bundy is simply spiraling. Some people have stated that, you know, the things he did while he was in Florida were simply, you know, out of boredom or that he didn't commit them at all. My personal belief, however, is that Bundy was in the midst of a serious psychotic spiral, which you see very often with serial killers, wherein they begin to get sloppy and they stop doing all of the things that they had done previously to avoid detection, and instead they start taking more and more chances. Bundy is in that phase of his crime spree. He's really throwing caution to the wind by having taken this obviously very visible van and these license plates driving around in it. It's almost as though he is unable to control himself at this point. And I've always suspected that Bundy secretly wanted to get caught 
at this point. Now, there are those who say no serial killer wants to get caught. That isn't true. There are killers who have stated that they, you know, their secret wish was that someone would catch them and stop them from doing these awful things. But their their sense of self preservation and their addiction to committing murders is so strong that they will not allow themselves to turn themselves in. Bundy, I believe, really was at this point in his murderous career of throwing caution to the wind. He's bored. You know, he said in later interviews that he missed the interactions with other people who he knew. And I think that that is part of it. But I think he's also wanting to get caught because he feels deep down that he is smarter than everyone else. And he misses the challenge that he experienced when he was actively in court with law enforcement. And when he was locked up, you know, prior to his two escapes, murdering for him really is no longer any sort of a challenge. But the things that court and being in court for his various crimes represented to him, I honestly think were a challenge that gave him a similar high as the act of committing murders did. On Wednesday, February 8th, 1978, 14-year-old Leslie Ann Palmenter left Jeb Stewart Jr. High School at roughly 2 o'clock in the afternoon. She was expecting to be picked up by her brother Danny in the parking lot to the Kmart that was located on the other side of the street. Now, keep in mind, Jacksonville is roughly 200 miles, give or take, from Tallahassee. As Leslie is in this parking lot waiting for her brother, a white van pulls up and a dark-haired man wearing a dark navy-type jacket, slacks, in need of a shave, and wearing sunglasses jumped out of the van and approached her, informing her that his name was Richard Burton and that he was from the fire department. Now, Leslie saw a badge pinned to his jacket that indeed said fire department, gave his name as Richard Burton. However, she felt uneasy about this man. Now, this man, who would later be identified as Ted Bundy, didn't know is that Leslie's father was the chief of detectives in the Jacksonville Homicide Unit. So as he's trying to talk to her and Leslie's not responding, she's kind of frozen, trying to get away from the man. He's not letting her go. And at this moment, her brother Danny pulls up in the work truck that bears the name of the family's construction visit. Business. He sees his sister, sees this strange guy, the van, the door open, and he immediately orders her into the truck and gets out asking the man what he's doing. The man starts stammering, saying nothing, nothing again as he rushes back to his van. Danny continues to pursue this man, asking him what the hell he wanted. And the man continues to say nothing over and over again before saying, I thought she was someone else, I'm looking for someone else, and rolling up the window before driving from the lot. Danny is not to be deterred, however, as it's obvious to him that something nefarious was underway. He follows the man through the parking lot and gets the license plate number, which happens to be 13D-11300. Now, both Danny and his sister informed their father of what Leslie accounted in the Kmart parking lot. And the father takes this information down, fully intent on tracking down this license plate and learning who the owner of this vehicle is. However, it's going to be a few days before that is 
able to happen as, again, he's a police officer working homicides and he is kept busy by other tasks. Now, some have stated that had Leslie's father followed through on the information his children had given him, it's possible that Bundy would have been apprehended then and there. However, I highly doubt that um, as Bundy quickly fled Jacksonville, although he is going to return more towards that area than to Tallahassee the following day, February 9th, when he drives to Lake City, Florida. I want to warn you that the crime that we are about to discuss is arguably one of the most disturbing crimes Ted Bundy was convicted for, and that is the abduction, rape, and murder of 12-year-old Kimberly Diane Leach. There's some aspects of this case that generally aren't put in Bundy literature that I'm going to discuss because I know them from having studied him quite extensively. In fact, um, this particular crime actually inspired one of the scenes from a book of mine called The Throwaway of Girls of Olympia, which was my attempt to pull away the glitz and glamour of a serial killer in the literary world and expose them for what they really are, which is nothing more than a violent, sadistic creature that exists solely to extinguish the lives of others. Now, on this day, Kimberly was informed that she had been selected as first runner-up to the Valentine's Queen at the upcoming dance. Something that those who knew her said she was extremely excited about. It was raining out on February 9th. Her and her friend left homeroom, went to the class that they were supposed to have afterwards, when they both realized that they had left things of theirs inside of the classroom and went back to homeroom to get it. They got their belongings and walked outside when Kimberly's friend realized that she had left something else inside the class. She goes back in to get it, and when she comes back out, she sees Kimberly being dragged across the schoolyard by a dark-haired man towards a white van. Now, other witnesses stated that this van was parked in such a way that it was holding up in traffic and that they assumed the man was the young girl's father called to school over some transgression that she had perpetrated. They stated that it was obvious the girl was upset and was crying as the man was yelling at her and dragging her across the school grounds into the van after throwing her inside the passenger's side door, the man stormed around the van into the driver's seat and then drove off. And Kimberly Leach's body is going to end up being found inside an old, dilapidated pig pen. This is going to be a few weeks later. Most stories have it that her body was extremely decayed and that she had been strangled, possibly bludgeoned. The part they leave out, however, is the fact that her nasal cavity was filled with mud. Ted Bundy, doing whatever it is that he had done to this poor young girl, forced her face down into mud while she was still alive and forced her to breathe that mud up in her to her nostrils before killing her. So right there, anyone who's listening to this and still has this romanticized idea about serial killers or Ted Bundy, I want you to think about that. He forced a young girl to breathe mud 
effectively leading to her demise had Bundy not strangled her. Even if he had held her, like, in that position, she still would have died because her nose and eventually her throat and lungs would have filled with this mud as she was struggling for breath against him. Now, numerous people saw this abduction, not realizing it was. One individual saw the white van as it was leaving the area suddenly swerve into their lane before getting back into their own lane. Now, the driver of this vehicle later told authorities that the dark-haired man driving the vehicle was not paying attention to the road and was instead turned towards the passenger seat where it appeared that he was screaming at someone who they could not see. Kimberly's parents, and indeed no one, knew she was missing until later that afternoon when the school's attendance office contacted the Leach family to ask why their daughter had not been in school that day. Obviously, her parents had no idea of this. They tell the school she had been. They later learned that she had been to school up until home room, and that after that point, she seems to have disappeared. And it's at this point that the stories of the man with the white band come to the attention of authorities. A be on the lookout is issued for Kimberly Leach, last seen wearing a brown football jersey with the number 83 on it, and jeans, a long dark coat with fake fur. Officers tried to assure the parents that it's very possible that their daughter had simply run away. However, the Leeches are not buying this. They know their daughter, and they insist that this is not, in fact, the case. And Jacksonville, Leslie's father finally gets around to contacting the Department of Motor Vehicles. This is on February 10th. They inform him that the plates had belonged to one Randy Reagan of Tallahassee, Florida, so Leslie's father then contacts the Tallahassee Police Department, informing them of what had occurred with his daughter two days prior. The police in Tallahassee agree that this is something that should be looked into, and they are able to track down Randy Reagan, who informs them that although his tags had been stolen, he hadn't reported them as stolen. He had simply gone out and gotten a new set. Some people have pointed to this and stated that it's proof that Bundy did not in fact commit the attempted abduction of in Jacksonville or the abduction and murder of Kimberly Leach. However, it was very common back then for individuals not to report their tags stolen, as most people back then, as they are now, don't want to get involved with the police. Now, news of this, as well as the white van having gone missing, are all over the police airwaves. And Leslie's father learns about this, and he, automatically he his, he gets that sinking feeling knowing what his daughter almost encountered and feeling certain what Kimberly Leach has encountered. So he arranges to have his children hypnotized. And as it's been said, Leslie actually relives the entire experience so much so that they have to call off the uh, hypnotism session. But from this, the police are able to get a sketch composite of the man who had attempted to abduct Leslie. Now, I do want to state that much like polygraphs and dental impressions, hypnotism is a pseudoscience. I don't know a terrible amount about it, only that it is not allowed in court. And unfortunately, in this case, there are a lot of individuals who are put under hypnosis in order to draw forth memories, and some have stated that these hypnotism sessions in which an individual's 
put into a calm state where they are extremely open to suggestions is what led to Ted Bundy being fingered for these crimes. It should also be noted, too, that somewhere around this point in time, Bundy was placed on the FBI's 10 most wanted list. And supporters of Bundy have pointed to this and stated that this is the reason why Leslie and her brother's sketches resembled Ted Bundy because they were, quote-unquote, trying to railroad Ted again. And my argument to that is simply this. No one knew during this period of time that Ted Bundy was even in Florida. So the idea that law enforcement would guide witnesses into fingering Bundy by drawing these, having these sketches made up of him is laughable at best. Now, back in Tallahassee, after the abduction of Kimberly Leach and the revelation about the license plate, officers really began to step up their patrols, believing that the perpetrator was more likely than not still in the area. And it's known that on at least two occasions, officers in unmarked cars saw Bundy. First of which was on the campus of Florida State University, where nothing much seems to happen. While the second occurred when an officer was patrolling and saw a man fiddling with the door on a car... He approached this man who told him that he had left his books inside the car. The officer asked him where the books were since he said he was getting them. Bundy replied, it's on the dashboard. He opens up the car door and the officer sees him touching a license plate. The officer asks what he's doing. Bundy says... Simply that he found it and hands the officer the tag, which bears 13-D-11-300. At which point, the man sprints off into the darkness, jumping over a retaining wall that, interestingly enough, butted up to the oak and disappears. The officer then... Traces the tag to Randy Reagan, goes to speak with Reagan, and immediately realizes that Reagan is not the man he had spoken to next to the vehicle. This officer would later state that the following day he learned about the stolen white Ford or white Dodge van that was being searched for and laments that there had been a white Dodge van parked behind the Toyota that Bundy had been getting into and that this van had had a flat tire. However, when the officer went back to look for the van, surprisingly, it was no longer there. This may simply be a case of the officer making a story better by adding juicier details as he is the only one to have seen this van parked there, and as we're going to see here shortly, the van had a lot of evidence inside of it, and I highly doubt that Ted Bundy, being as crafty and intelligent as he was, would have kept it so close to where he was staying. On February 11th, Ted Bundy stole an orange Volkswagen bug, placing a set of plates from another VW bug he had encountered onto it, and left Tallahassee heading west. The next day, February 13th, a number of things happened. The white van used to, in the attempted abduction in Jacksonville and then the abduction of Kimberly Leach was found parked on a side street in Tallahassee. It was spotted by someone who worked at the audiovisual department who recognized it. Police came and 
grabbed this van, taking it in for inspection, and immediately they noticed a couple of things. First, the van interior had been meticulously wiped down, which made finding any form of fingerprints impossible. Whoever had taken this vehicle had done too good of a job at removing any trace of themselves. They also discovered that in the back of the van, which was really like a cargo van, there was a carpet, and on this carpet there was a lot of dirt, leaves, and tree branches. And after removing all of this, they noticed that it appeared something heavy had been lying on this carpet and then dragged out of the van. There were also blood stains on this carpet, at least two of them, which were linked to a type B person, which Kimberly Leach happened to be, unfortunately. Although police were no closer to finding her body, it's known that Bundy encountered at least one individual on his trip west. He attempted to use a credit card at a hotel that bore a woman's name, and the desk clerk would not allow him to use it, and he reportedly threw the card in the woman's face before running off. Again, this could be a simple case of, you know, Bundy sightings, which became extremely prevalent after Bundy's arrest. There are no known sightings of Ted Bundy from 9 a.m. on the 13th until the 15th. When a patrolman notices an orange VW bug coming out from in between two buildings, Pensacola being small, he doesn't recognize the vehicle, so he begins to follow it, turning on his lights for the vehicle to pull over. And This part of the story has always been curious is to me only in so far as to the best of the officer's knowledge at this point Bundy has not broken any laws and the idea that the officer can just arbitrarily pull him over for whatever uh it's just wrong I don't care if it's a serial killer or not Bundy ends up Taking off, the officer gives chase. About a mile later in the next town over, Bundy pulls over. The officer orders him out of the car, tells him to get on the ground. Bundy refuses. The officer draws his gun. Bundy does as he says. As the officer puts the handcuff on him, Bundy kicks the feet out from underneath the officer, gets up, and takes off in a foot race in shoes. At one point, the officer thinks he has shot Bundy, who goes down, but when he gets to Bundy. Bundy comes up and the scuffle continues. Eventually, Bundy is subdued. Now, according to this officer, Bundy continuously made comments about whether or not the officer will kill him if he tries to run. He refuses to give them a name beyond Kenneth Meisner, they find him to be in possession of numerous stolen items, credit cards, identification for other individuals, women's identification, the television set, a whole slew of things. But he refuses to talk unless he has a, an attorney present. He's taken to the hospital where his wounds are treated, which are really superficial, and then brought back to the jail. Bundy is refusing to give anything other than his name, even when officers from Pensacola arrive and inform him that they know he's not Kenneth Miser. Bundy refuses to give his name. He makes numerous phone calls while he is there talking to an attorney in Georgia, another attorney friend of his in Washington who tells him, you know, don't talk to anyone without legal counsel. He speaks with a public defender who really doesn't get much from Bundy other than is admitting to the various thefts. And then a curious thing happens. 
in the early morning hours of February 16th, Bundy lets his jailers know that he's ready to talk. When he starts talking to them, he tells them his name. They don't know who that is. One of them goes and gets the FBI 10 most wanted list, which obviously Ted is on. Ted autographs it for him. And he really dances around the subject of anything more nefarious that he might have done other than robberies. Even when being questioned about the kidnapping of Carol Rancha, he tiptoes around it, letting them know he can't talk about it. It's complicated, at which point Bundy eventually tells them to turn off the tape recorder. Now, in Florida during this period of time, they were allowed to bug the interrogation rooms even after a suspect asked them to stop recording. Although, on this particular instance, the recording did not work. Eventually, all of this is going to be thrown out of court, all of this interrogation. But when the tape is off, Bundy starts trying to tell them about the fantasies he's had his entire life, that he was a quote-unquote night person and a vampire and a peeping Tom, although he repeatedly insists he never did did anything acting out these fantasies but that he had built up a massive block inside of him that would ensure he would never be able to talk about these fantasies that he had anytime the murders were brought up Bundy is reported to have said that he doesn't want to lie to them but if they press the issue the answer will be no They, officers had been inundated with calls from other law enforcement agencies as well as the media. And through all of this, they discovered that Ted Bundy was suspected of 36 murders. And supposedly when given this number by these detectives, Bundy responded with, add one number to that and you'll have it. This has led to speculation that Bundy could have meant that he had killed 37 women, 137 women, or 360 women, although those numbers will never truly be known. Um, We're going to talk more about that in another episode where we talk about additional unknown victims. Ted is also supposed to have told the officers that he preferred Volkswagens because they got good gas mileage and because you could take out the front seat. One one of the officers suggested this was because he could carry a person in the front seat that way. Bundy is supposed to have responded, I don't like that terminology, to which the officer responded, you can carry cargo like that. Ted is said to have responded yes and asked, Why that was, Bundy is supposed to have said you can control it better, meaning that his victims were still alive while they were in the front seat of the Volkswagen and he could have complete control over them. However, again, there is no way to fully verify these statements as although Bundy did confess at the end of his life, Much of that information has never been released by the officers that he confessed to. And if you know the details that Bundy did confess to that were made public, which we are going to cover in probably the next episode, you will understand why these officers chose not to put all of the information out there. During this interrogation, Bundy is also said to have been elusive when Kimberly Leach was discussed, when an officer begged him to give the location of her body so that her family can be informed. Bundy is said to have stated, quote, I can't do that. The site is horrible. He is also said to have told the officers who transported him back to Tallahassee when 
questioned about the location of Quim Kimberly Leach's body and told that her family needs closure, but I'm the most cold-hearted son of a bitch you'll ever meet. It's known that Bundy called and Rule on the morning of the 17th and that he was unaware his public defenders were outside waiting for him and some have stated that this was the officers keeping him from speaking to his, you know, his attorneys in violation of the law, something they vehemently denied. It should be pointed out, though, that this is a well-known tactic of law enforcement. Uh, they have thousands of times throughout modern history been known to keep a suspect isolated from their public defenders or from their the lawyers that they're paying in order to try and get them to confess to the crimes before eventually letting the lawyers see their charge. Whether that's the case with Bundy or not, we'll never really fully know. However, we can say with certainty that others who learned where Bundy was attempted to get through to him and were met with a stony wall of silence by the police in Pensacola. Obviously, this is a big deal. You know, they've captured this man suspected of all these various crimes. They're not going to give up access to him so that he can not self-incriminate, which is in itself against the law. Uh, fortunately, even today, we still see this type of thing, and the people saying, oh, you're de you're defending Bundy. No, I believe in an individual's right not to incriminate themselves and to have access to effective legal counsel, no matter what crime it is that they are accused of. Despite the fact that Bundy was the prime suspect in the Chi Omega murders, the assault further down the street, as well as the abduction of Kimberly Leach, at this point, they don't have enough to hold him on those charges. So instead, he is charged with multiple counts of auto theft larceny, stealing of credit cards, that type of thing, as officers and then later prosecutors work on building their case against Ted Bundy. Obviously, they had been in contact with officials in Utah and Colorado and knew the flight risk that Bundy posed. So he was placed in manacles along with a leg brace that hobbled him when he walked. This was their efforts to make certain that Bundy would not be able to move around freely. However, let's be honest, if he really wanted to, given what we know about Ted Bundy, it's very possible that he could have found a way around all of these things or to remove them. However, one thing about Bundy is that he had a super ego and he saw the attention that he was getting from both law enforcement and by local media and he seemed to bask in this. Ted loved to be the attention or the center of attention just as much as he enjoyed blending into the background and going unnoticed. And with everything going on, some commentators have stated that it may in fact be that the crimes Bundy committed while he was in Florida were a subconscious effort on his part to be back in the center of attention. That's not to say that he was intentionally trying to get himself incarcerated and only that knowing that he is the focal point of so many people's lives is something that really seemed to feed his ego 
and going into Florida, committing these crimes when, by all rights, any sane person, and I'm using the term sane somewhat loosely here, would know that to get involved in those types of crimes, again, would bring law enforcement's attention back onto you, but also, more likely than not, result in your capture. Bundy did say in interviews many years later that when he was on the run from Colorado, he was very lonely, and that even when he had been incarcerated in Colorado, he took some solstice in the interactions that he was able to have with his jailers. A very prominent attorney from Georgia attempted to represent Bundy. This man was known for his grandstanding and was almost on par with the likes of an F. Lee Bailey. This man gave statements to the media where he basically admitted that Ted enjoyed the attention almost as much as he enjoyed anything else. Now, ultimately, a judge is going to disallow this lawyer from representing Bundy due to the fact that he saw this lawyer's inclusion in the case as making it more of a media circus than it already was, and proponents for Bundy have correctly pointed out that the state of Florida stacked everything that they could in their favor when they were investigating and then trying Ted Bundy, and that this was morally wrong of the state. And I can't say that I disagree with that. I mean, my personal opinion is that a defendant should be allowed to have whatever legal counsel they choose, whether that's to defend themselves or to have a lawyer with a reputation for defending individuals such as themselves from out of state come in and defend them. And the judge is disallowing this man's inclusion really, in my opinion, does weigh heavily into the not a fair trial category. Bundy petitions the court to defend himself, and this is going to end up happening with caveats throughout the remainder of his life, where he's going to defend himself, or at least be a part of his counsel, and with the state providing him with various public defenders, and then later on, after conviction, law firms stepping forward to de- Police never gave up in their search for Kimberly Leach. And after finding the van with its vegetation in the back, they had various scientists look at this ed- vegetation, and it was decided that there were only a few areas within Florida that such a diverse and unique range of fauna could have come from, so the searchers end up focusing their attention on those areas, and it leads to the discovery of Kimberly Leach's body on April 7th, I briefly touched on this in the last episode where I said that this crime is considered one of the most heinous that Bundy committed. And I want to reiterate that here because we're going to get into some discussion of facts that is generally not looked at when discussing Ted Bundy. People talk about the fact that He's known to have gone back and committed acts of necrophilia with his victims, putting makeup on the faces, and even have gone back and just lain with the rotting bodies. Kimberly Leach's murder, they glance over some facts that were out there for a long time and seem to have been to have fallen by the wayside. And these facts are both 
stunning and highly disturbing because, at least from my understanding, Kimberly Leach went through a horrific ordeal, and I want you to be aware of that before this next section. Now, officers had located tennis a tennis shoe and strands of human hair near the Sawani River at some point in February. In, in the beginning of March, they found a pile of cigarette butts near the entrance to Sawney State Park. Uh, they didn't put this information out there at the start. And the reason the cigarette butts were significant is they were found to be the same brand that were in the ashtray in the Volkswagen that Bundy was arrested driving. Now, searchers continue to look for the body of Kimberly Leach. And on April 7th, as they're searching, they come across an old dilapidated hog pen out in the middle of the woods and the hog pens boarded up they look through it and they see a pile of clothing and this pile of clothing is, one part of it is a jersey like, like a football jersey with the number 83 on it Kimberly Leach's body was nude except for a white turtleneck. Her clothing was piled beneath her. There was no sign of blunt force trauma. However, there were marks around her neck, some form of puncture, although the doctors were unable to state whether this was from a blunt object or a sharp object. And now here is the part that often gets overlooked and I want to warn you people again that this this is a disturbing aspect of Kimberly's demise there was mud inside of her nasal cavity now you may be thinking that's because she had lain out in the middle of you know this desolate pig pen for months on end no Kimberly was found lying on her back in order for her to get the mud inside of her nasal cavity she would have had to be face down and alive and what this means is that unfortunately Kimberly Leach at some point during her ordeal her face was shoved into the ground while she was alive and she was forced to breathe in mud or dirt I want you to envision that for a moment, especially those of you, and I know there are some people out there who don't believe Bundy did any of the things he did, or even worse, who look up to this man. This young girl, this 12-year-old, she's taken against her will from school. She is driven out to the middle of nowhere with something that is in the form of a human being, but is not a human being. She is sexually assaulted by this individual. Um, I don't know the details of that assault, thankfully. Then she is has her face shoved into the dirt so that she is breathing this in. How terrifying that must have been these last hours of her life, alone, out in the middle of nowhere with this creature, breathing in dirt. Now, whether or not this is what, in fact, killed her is inconsequential. Had this particular form of the assault continued on, it would have killed her as the dirt would have gotten down into her throat, into her lungs, forcing her to vomit with the face pushed down into the dirt, she would have been asphyxiated on her own vomit and on 
this mud or this dirt, and it would have killed her. Uh, apologize for that graphic description, but this particular murder, since the first time I ever read about it many, many years ago, has always stayed with me because of how brutal it was. The age of the victim and how callously her body was thrown aside by the perpetrator, Ted Bundy. You know, Kimberly Leach did not have an opportunity to experience life in any form beyond her 12 years. And that's not to say that the other young women who Ted Bundy murdered got to experience life, but they got to experience more of it than she did. They got to, you know, hopefully go out on dates and maybe feel, you know, love. Kimberly didn't have any of those options. It was taken from her, and it was taken from her in one of the most sadistic and brutal fashions possible. And you've heard other episodes. Anytime a, a young child is killed, it, it bothers me, and it's specifically because the, these children haven't had an opportunity to experience the life, you know, the good things as well as the bad. It's just simply taken from them. And I, I'm going to, you know, spoiler alert you that Ted Bundy ends up going to the chair for this. And I, I my personal opinion is that anybody who does things to children, that is what they deserve to have. Now, because Kimberly Leach's blood was found in the back of the van, it's fairly obvious she did not die where her body was discovered. Uh, you know, I have read differing accounts that she was assaulted both in the van and outside, which makes sense given the fact that there is this dirt and blood inside of her nasal cavity. Then Bundy placed her body back into the van, drove to this park, and dragged her dead body out of the van, stripping it, probably performing acts of necrophilia with her, and then leaving her there like a piece of garbage. They were able to match Kimberly Leach's blood type to the blood that was found in the back of the van. They were also able to match fibers from the carpet that was in the back of the van to fibers that were found both on Kimberly's body and as well as on her clothing. Keep in mind, however, that during this period of time, fiber evidence was thought to be you know, conclusive, like a fingerprint. The reality is that we have learned in the decades since fiber evidence is decent, but it is not an exact science. And that is why oftentimes now when a case is brought to trial, the prosecution will only have that fiber evidence as a very small piece of the case that they are working on, as opposed to this point in time where, like with Wayne Williams, the man who was convicted for the adult murders in the Atlanta child murders, that was the main piece of evidence brought against him, which led to his conviction was this fiber evidence. Fiber evidence can be contested and in court and has been thrown out in certain cases, as it's not an exact science, and it's almost impossible to say that the fibers found on a body came from one area ex with, to the exclusion of all others. And that is something that Bundy's lawyers would later fight, although they would not win that particular battle. Kimberly's body was too decomposed for them to get fingerprints off of it, and 
the van was found to have been wiped completely clean of all fingerprints. However, they also discovered tags from a sporting goods store in Jacksonville, and these tags were linked to a 10-inch hunting knife that had been purchased by a man at the store on February 8th, if you'll remember, that's the day that Bundy attempted to kidnap the young girl across the street from her school in the Kmart parking lot. Later, this man would see an image of Ted Bundy on television and would contact a state investigator and inform them that he was absolutely certain that the man he had sold the knife to was, in fact, Ted Bundy. Another piece of circumstantial evidence used to link Ted Bundy to the murder of Kimberly Leach were credit card receipts. Now, if you'll recall... We talked in the last episode about Bundy having this unnatural compulsion to always ensure that he had full tank of gas in his vehicle. Well, they were able to link some credit card receipts from cards recovered from Ted Bundy to gas stations in the area. They also were able to link another credit card to a room that Bundy had stayed in in the area, which was under the last name of Evans. There was also food and drinks charged to this credit card. It should be noted that the individual who checked the man under the name of Evans into the hotel room stated that they appeared to be under the influence of something as their eyes were glassy. They were disheveled looking with at least two or three days worth of a beard, while witnesses the next day who saw the man dragging Kimberly Leach to the white van stated that the individual they saw was clean-shaven. It's an important thing, uh, and one which Bundy would use to try and prove his, uh, his innocence. Now, Ted Bundy ends up getting charged with numerous counts, forgery, uh, the murder charges, all of that type of thing. A judge orders Bundy to supply hair and blood samples. He's also ordered to supply dental impressions. This is because of the bite marks found at the Child Mega House. And again, as I've discussed already, Bite mark evidence is one of the key factors that is going to lead Ted Bundy to be convicted by the jury in the Chai Omega massacre trial, and that it is highly imperfect, and many courts no longer allow that. On July 27th, 1978, a grand jury in Tallahassee, Florida, handed down an indictment against Ted Bundy for the crimes he had committed in that city. And Bundy had been in Pensacola for the majority of that day dealing with various legal matters. He's returned to his cell by that evening, at which point at roughly 930, he is summoned by the sheriff of Tallahassee, who had invited various members of the news media there to ambush with Bundy with this indictment. And as the cameras show, Bundy immediately understands what's going on as the elevator opens. He attempts to hide back in the elevator. They won't let him. And Bundy goes from quiet and reserved into full-fledged charismatic mode, putting on a show for the cameras as he attempts to make the sheriff who was trying to you know really grandstand on this case in the hopes of getting reelected look like an absolute idiot and while i can't say that the sheriff looked like an absolute idiot bundy came off as cool confident 
And again, charismatic to the cameras, basically flipping a middle finger to the sheriff. Ted Bundy is going to end up being put on trial for the murders and assaults in Tallahassee in 1979, after which he's going to go on trial for the murder of Kimberly Leach. Between this point in time that we're talking about, really up until the end of his life, Ted Bundy is going to showboat his way. He's really going to, from this point onward, become the idea that is affixed in many American minds of the atypical Hollywood-type serial killer that is very outgoing and talkative and charismatic, the exact opposite of what most serial killers really are. Ted Bundy is beyond a shadow of a doubt, the very first of what I've heard one member of law enforcement refer to as a superstar serial killer. That is an individual who, based on the way that they act, interact with the media, is able to attract a good number of female followers to them keep their name in print, and really become this thing that they had never been before, which is the center of attention. And we are going to discuss that, as well as the trials, in our next episode. However, at this point, I am going to end this show for today. I hope all of my d and enjoyed this episode. And until next time, stay morbid.